Okay, we're back in John, and we're going to finish up uh, chapter 3. John chapter 3, this is lesson number 6 in the Gospel of John. So I want to go, I, I should have done this on your uh, blackboard here, you see that I put Genesis 3. And I, I'm going to go back there because I should have done that on the first teaching. If you remember in, uh, of John, uh, in John 3 and 1 through 6, uh, where he met Nicodemus, and he told Nicodemus, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God, and unless you are born of water and of the Spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born again of the Spirit is spirit. So this uh, directly relates to Genesis 3, 1 through 6. Okay, remember when I covered John 1? Uh, the very beginning of John 1, the first few verses, 1 through 4, I think, uh, it, it talked about uh, that God, that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. That was John 1, 1 through 3. And in the very beginning of Genesis chapter 1, compared to John chapter 1, because in Genesis 1 is when God created everything, and Jesus was there with him, and he created the light and the darkness. And uh, so here... In John 3, 1 through 6, when he tells Nicodemus he must be born again to enter back into the kingdom of God, this is because in Genesis 3, they got kicked out of the kingdom of God because of their disobedience and listening to Satan. And I want to just read that real quickly in Genesis 3 to show you how Jesus had to come and live the perfect life and be crucified and resurrected so that he can redeem us from what Adam and Eve caused or brought about on the earth. And this is what it was. Verse 1 in Genesis 3. The serpent was the craftiest of all the creatures the Lord made. The serpent came to the woman and said, Really? None of the fruit in the garden? God said, You cannot eat any of it? And the woman said, Of course we may eat it. It's only the fruit from the tree at the center of the garden, or the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that we are not supposed to eat. For God says we mustn't eat it or touch it or we will die. That's the lie, the serpent told her. You'll not die. God knows very well that the instant you eat it, you'll become like him. Now, I'm going to read all my scriptures today out of the Living Bible. Uh, I've been reading them out of the King James, but I'm going to read most all of these, most of these today out of the Living Bible. Uh, I, I like the translation. It, it stays as close to the true, uh, I believe, most of it stays closest to the true translation that I found most Bibles do. And I'll read the King James more often because it kind of gives you the the, uh, the raw translation right out of the King James English. And so even though it's somewhat hard to understand, I rely on the Holy Spirit to bring me the understanding instead of some translations in their translation try to uh, interpret it themselves what it means. But I like the Living Bible. Um, so here, it says, you'll not die, the serpent told her. God knows very well that the instant you eat it, you'll become like him. Or in the King James, it says, you'll become as, as God. For your eyes will be open, and you'll be able to distinguish good from evil. You will be, you'll have wisdom to distinguish good and evil. You'll be as God. You'll be like him. So the woman was convinced how lovely and fresh looking it was, and it would make her wise. So she ate some of the fruit and gave some to her husband, and he ate it too. And as they ate it, suddenly they became aware of their nakedness and were embarrassed. So they strung fig leaves together to cover themselves. That evening they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden, or in the King James it says the voice of the Lord, walking in the garden. And they hid themselves among the trees because they were afraid. And the Lord God said to Adam, Where are you, Adam? Why are you hiding? And Adam said, I heard you coming. And it says, I was afraid in the King James Version. Uh, so I hid myself. I didn't want you to see me naked. Who told you that you were naked? The Lord said, have you eaten the fruit from the tree that I warned you about? Yes, Adam said, but it was the woman you gave me who brought me some and I ate it. Then the Lord asked the woman, how could you do such a thing? Well, the serpent tricked me, she replied. So if you continue on to verse 22 is what I want to get to, but verse 1 through 6 compared to John 1 through 6 is where the fall of man came. 
They listened to the, another voice instead of the voice of God in the garden. They listened to another voice that deceived them into believing that if you ate of this tree of knowledge of good and evil, you can know how to live for yourself. You can be as wise as God and not have to rely on God. And because of this, in verse 22, Then the Lord said, Now that the man has become as we are, knowing good from evil, what if he eats the fruit of the tree of life and lives forever? So the Lord God banished him forever from the Garden of Eden and sent him out to form the land from which he had been taken from. Thus God expelled him and placed mighty angels at the east of the Garden of Eden with a flaming sword to guard the entrance to the tree of life. So here is another clarification or um, another uh, confirming scripture of what I told you last week where I read in Revelation 22 uh, that he that is he that is um, holy let him be holy forever he that is wicked let him be wicked forever he that is unclean let him be unclean forever in the state you die you will be like that forever so right here it proves in this Genesis in chapter 3 verse 22 he said now that he has become as us and knows good from evil we cannot let him eat from the tree of life and live forever. So God did not intend man to live in an eternal state, in a fallen state. In other words, he did not intend man to go into eternal life, into the kingdom of heaven, in the fallen state he was in. Where he decides, in his own wisdom, because he ate from this tree, he has now the nature of Satan. Because Satan, I'm not going to get into all that, but Satan was created by God, put into the heavens to to lead all the praises of God in the whole universe, and he rebelled against God. He didn't want to stay in the position God put him. He thought he was greater than God. He wanted to lift himself above God. So he was cast down to earth, out of heaven, out of his throne that God had given him, or the position God had given him. And he came out, came to deceive us. And he deceived the first man and woman into taking what God had told him not to so that he could be wise as God and not have to depend on God. And so in this state, God did not want him to live it forever. Okay? You cannot go into eternal life in this kind of a state uh, where you do not depend on God for everything, even the wisdom to know what to do. And that's why we have to bring back a relationship with him through being born again and spirit-filled. And that brings us from Genesis 3 to John 3. But I also want, before I go on, to read a scripture in Proverbs 3. So, I mean, they all tie into one another. Genesis 3 was the fall where they was deceived into think, believing that they didn't have to depend upon God. They could be wise themselves in their, in their own uh, wisdom. They could be as God. But Proverbs 3, also 1 through 6, I'm going to start in 5, says, Proverbs 3, 5 and 6, Do not lean or trust or be confident. Wait, I'm sorry. I'll go back. Genesis 3, verse 5 says, Lean on, trust in, and be confident in the Lord with all of your heart and mind. And do not rely on your own insight or understanding. This is how Satan tempted Eve. You can rely on your own insight and understanding if you eat from this tree. In all of your ways, know and recognize and acknowledge Him. Now acknowledge God. And He will direct and make straight and plain all of your paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes, but reverently fear and worship the Lord, and turn entirely away from evil. So 6 says, In all of your ways, every way in life, acknowledge God and recognize Him, and let Him direct and make plain all of your paths. So this is Proverbs 3, 1 through 6. That was in the Amplified Bible. So, let's go back to John. I want to clear that up, how John 3, 1 through 6, is the uh, remedy of Genesis 3, 1 through 6, where a man fell and believed Satan's lies, another voice, that he could rely on his own understanding. And John 3 is where Jesus said you must be born again and filled with the Spirit so you can rely entirely on God's wisdom and ask for His wisdom and through the, through the leading of the Holy Spirit in everything you do, in all of your ways. And then you can enter back into the kingdom which Adam and Eve was kicked out of and banished from. Okay, so let's finish up 
in John 3, and we're going to take, take up from verse 22. And I'm reading this out of the Living Bible. So afterwards, Jesus and his disciples left Jerusalem and stayed for a while in Judea and were baptizing there. So they were water baptizing Jesus and his disciples uh, in Judea. And at this same time, John the Baptist was not yet put in prison. He was baptizing at Anon near Salim because there was a lot, plenty of water there. So the water might have been low in the Jordan in other places. So he was at this place because there was plenty of water to water baptize. So one day, someone began an argument with John's disciples, telling them that Jesus' baptism was the best. So they came to John and said, Master, the man you met on the other side of the Jordan River, the one you told us was the Messiah, he is baptizing also, and everybody is going over there instead of coming here to us. So I'm going to read that again. These people came to John the Baptist and said, Master, the man you met on the other side of the Jordan, the one that you told us was the Messiah, so he's talking about Jesus. Remember, John the Baptist pointed him out. He is also baptizing, and everybody is going over there instead of coming here to us. So John replied, God in heaven appoints every man's work. My work is to prepare the way for, the man, for that man so that everyone will go to him. You yourselves know how plainly I told you that I am not the Messiah. I am sent here to prepare the way for him. That is all. The crowds will naturally go to the main attraction. The bride will go wherever the bridegroom is. A bridegroom's friend rejoices with him. I am the bridegroom's friend, and I am filled with joy at his success. He must become greater and greater, and I must become less and less. He has come from heaven and is greater than anyone else. So there is again proof that he came from heaven. He was with God the Father before he became, but before he be, the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. I am of the earth, and my understanding is limited to the things of the earth. He tells us what he has seen and heard, but how few believe what he tells them. Those who believe him discover that God is a fountain of truth. But this one, sent by God, speaks God's words. For God's Spirit is upon him without measure or without limit. The Father loves this man because he is his Son, and God has given him everything there is. And all who trust him, God's Son, to save them, have eternal life. But those who don't believe and trust him and obey him shall never see, he shall never see heaven or enter heaven. Remember, you must be born again to see it. But the wrath of God remains on him. So what I want to get out, what I get out of this when I read it is how 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 much John had the right spirit about him, or the right attitude. And right away, the argument here between John's disciples and the Pharisees um, was that Jesus was also baptizing in his disciples and on the other side of the Jordan. And they wanted to know which one was the best. They, they felt that like Jesus' baptism was better. And so they came to John and said, aren't you upset that uh, everybody's leaving your baptism and going over to Jesus? Or aren't you upset that everybody's leaving your church and going to another church? I want to just kind of paraphrase that. But John was not upset. He said that God in heaven appoints every man his own work. My work was to prepare the way for Jesus. So that everyone will go to him. You yourselves know I told you I'm not the Messiah. The cross will naturally go to the main attraction. The bride, who born again disciples are, the bride will naturally go to the bridegroom, Jesus Christ. I'm just a friend of the bridegroom, and I rejoice that you are following him, that you are leaving me and following him. He must become greater and greater, and I must become less and less. So I get out of that is how much churches, any denomination, will do to keep their people from leaving and going somewhere else. I mean, any church, you can name it whether it's Catholicism, Protestantism, uh, full gospel churches, Pentecostal, 
you name it. They will do anything they have to to keep people in their congregation, not like John the Baptist, to keep will keep them from even following the one that they're supposed to be pointing out, Jesus Christ. You know, convincing people that they're the ones who hear from God and you have to come and hear what we say because we are the big, we are the masters. You know, we are the teachers and we know what to tell you to do to follow Christ. They won't try to lead people and to Christ himself. Remember, I, I, said, I told you I was going to share a scripture that I was trying to find last week. That was in Matthew 23. I couldn't remember where it was. Talking about those who the Pharisees and scribes were not going into the kingdom themselves and were trying to talk people out of going into it, them, going into it also, because they wanted to keep people in their congregation, you might say. Trying to talk people out of water baptism or trying to talk people out of being born again. Uh, I mentioned how uh, not long or some time after I got born again, I mentioned that to a priest and he told me that was silly. That I didn't need that. I was born again at water baptism, and that um, that all I needed was the church. And I talked to a Protestant uh, at one time and told him about the baptism of the Holy Spirit with a gift of tongues. And he said, "That's not something you need. You just need to be born again. You don't need the Holy Spirit with tongues." That passed a long time ago with the first apostle. So they they don't want to enter in, and they want to keep others from entering in. I'm going to read that in Matthew 23. But it's amazing what priests or pastors or churches will do to keep people dependent upon them instead of making them or getting them to a place to where they're dependent upon God himself speaking to them. Remember Proverbs 3 says, Do not rely on your own insight or wisdom or understanding. Trust in the Lord and, and acknowledge him in every way that you, in all of your ways, and he's going to direct every path. Okay, so I mean they'll do anything, religious programs, religious idols, all kind of sideshows, uh, all kind of programs to get you involved in, instead of making you ready to be a minister, making you ready to be God's priest. We're all called to be God's priest. I shared that already in one of my teachings, and we're all shared to be God's ministers, not just an elite group of people. Uh, now, I want to read. I, I read this already. I'm going to come back to John 4, but I want to go to Ephesians. I mean, John 3. Go to Ephesians 4. I've read this already once, but I'm going to read it again. I may have not turned to it, actually. But in Ephesians 4, I have on your blackboard, verse 11, it says this. Uh, let's see. The same one who Jesus thought of Jesus, who came down from heaven is the one who went back up that he might feel all things everywhere and some of us have been given special abilities or gifts as apostles others he has given the gift of being able to preach well some have abilities special abilities in winning people to Christ helping those to trust him as their savior still others have a gift for caring for God's people as a shepherd does for his sheep leading and teaching them in the ways of God so in the King James Version, it talks about the fivefold ministry. That's what it's talking about. And it calls them apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And this is what he's saying in verse 11. They've been given special gifts to do these things. Why is it that he gives us these special abilities to do these certain things best? It is so that God's people will be equipped to do better work for Christ building up the church and the body to be in a position of strength and maturity until finally we are able, we are all believe alike about our salvation and about our Savior, God's Son. And we all become fully grown in the Lord, yes, to, point, to the point of being filled full with Christ. So the whole reason that these fivefold ministries are here is so that they can equip us to do our work better for Christ. Build us up. In other words, they're supposed to train us up how to hear from God, how to be directed by the Holy Spirit. If a minister is not bringing you to Christ and teaching you how to hear him and follow him, but trying to keep you under their uh, control, then it's not of God. Ministers are here to 
help each individual learn his own ministry, find his own ministry, find his own uh, priesthood ministry and believers ministry so that we can know the work God has given each of us. That's what they're sent for, not to keep us bound into in their denominations or keep them us bound, uh, you know, like having to depend on them always to hear from God for us. We are, we are supposed to be able to hear from God ourselves. And that is what ministry is supposed to teach us how to do. And I also want to cover a scripture in Isaiah 61. You turn to Isaiah 61. This is also in the Living Bible. Verse 1 says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. That's the Holy Spirit. When you're baptized with the Holy Spirit, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the suffering and the afflicted. He has sent me to comfort the brokenhearted, to announce liberty to the captives, and to open the eyes of the blind. He has sent me to tell those who mourn that the time of God's favor to them has come, and the day of wrath to their enemies. To all who mourn in Israel, he will give beauty for ashes, joy instead of mourning, praise instead of heaviness. For God has planted them like a strong and graceful oak for his own glory. And then go to verse 6. Here it is. Isaiah 61, 1 through 6. We read John 3, 1 through 6. Proverbs 3, 1 through 6. Genesis 3, 1 through 6. Here's Isaiah 61, 1 through 6. 6 says, You shall be called the priest of the Lord. You shall be called ministers of our God. You shall be fed with the treasures of the nations and shall glory in their riches. Instead of shame and dishonor, you shall have a double portion of prosperity and everlasting joy. So the whole point is that you be called the priest of God and you be called the ministers of God. Because the Lord has anointed each one of us with his Holy Spirit. To bring good news to suffering humanity. To heal and comfort the brokenhearted. That's what the Holy Spirit is in us to do. Not only for us, but make us into ministers also. And to the priesthood of God. That we with the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Can be ministers to a lost world. And in 1 Peter. Uh, in 1 Peter 2.15. Says that. Peter himself, in writing the letter of 1 Peter, says in chapter 2, verse 15, that you are a royal priesthood. You are a chosen generation. God has called us all to be in the priesthood. Okay. But here, and John is saying here, and going back to John 3, they were trying to get John upset that they were leaving his baptism and, and, and all headed out to Jesus' baptism. And John said, that's exactly why I came for him. You know. My work was to point people to Jesus so that they would follow him and his voice, not follow me and my church, not follow me and my doctrines, not follow me and my denomination. I'm supposed to be pointing people to Jesus and hear his voice and learn how to follow him and learn how to hear his voice. Okay, so let's go ahead and finish John 3. 31, he has come from heaven and is greater than everyone else. I am of the earth and my understanding is limited to the things of the earth. He tells what he is, but he tells what he has seen and heard. But how few believe what he tells them. Those who believe him discover that God is a fountain of truth. For this one, sent by God, speaks God's words. For God's spirit is upon him without measure or limit. Okay, for God loves this man because he is his son, and God has given him everything there is, and all who trust him to save them have eternal life. Those who don't believe and trust him and obey him shall never see heaven or eternal life, for the wrath of God will remain upon them. Okay, and from there I want to go to uh, Matthew 23, it is the scripture I was trying to find last week <clears throat> so go to Matthew 23 and 
we will start in verse in verse one. I have a, yeah, I have it one. Okay. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, "You would think that these Jewish leaders and these Pharisees were Moses, the way they keep making up some so many laws. And of course, you should obey their every whim. It may be all right to do what they say." But above, all, above everything else, don't follow their example. For they don't do what they tell you to do. They load you with impossible demands that they themselves don't even, don't even try to help. Everything they do is done for show. They act holy by wearing on their arms little prayer boxes with scriptures and by lengthening the, the fringes of their robes. So it says they do... Everything they do is to be done for show. It's done for show. They act holy by wearing on their arms little prayer boxes with scriptures and by lengthening the fringes or the borders of all their robes and how they love to sit at the head of the table at banquets and in the reserved pews in the synagogue. How they enjoy the, the, that the, the respect paid them on the streets or the reverence paid them on the streets and to be called rabbi, master, don't ever let anyone call you master, for only God is your master, and all of you are on, are on the same level as brothers. So let me read that again. How they enjoy the reverence paid them on the streets, and to call be called master, but don't let anyone call you master, for God, only God is your master, and all of you are on the same level as brothers. We're all on the same level. And don't address anyone here on earth as Father, for only God in heaven should be addressed like that. And don't be called Master, for, on, for only one is your Master, even the Messiah. The more lowly you service to others is, the greater you are. To be the greatest is to be a servant. But those who think themselves great shall be disappointed and humbled. And those who humble themselves, God will exalt. Woe to you, Pharisees, you, and you other religious leaders, you hypocrites, for you won't, go, you won't let others enter the kingdom of heaven, and you won't go in yourselves. This is the scripture I was trying to find last week. In other words, you won't go into the kingdom yourself, and you won't let others enter it. You try to talk others out of it. Why? Because you don't want to lose the people out of your congregation. You don't want to point people to Jesus and follow his voice. But you want to be respected as the one, or reverence as the one, that knows all things of the wisdom of God, and everyone must believe what you say. You pretend to be holy with all your long public prayers in the streets, while you are evicting widows from their homes. Yes, uh, woe upon you hypocrites, you go to all extremes or lengths to make one convert but then when you turn him, when you make one convert, you turn him into twice the son of hell as you are yourselves. You blind guides, woe upon you, for your rule is that to swear by God's temple means nothing. Okay, and it goes on. And I think that's where I wanted to go to. Let's see. Verse 13. But I want to go to 34 and 35. Uh, jump there. And it says, I will send you prophets and wise men and inspired writers and you will kill some by crucifixion, and you will rip open the backs of others with whips in your synagogues, and you will hound them from city to city, so that you will become guilty of all the blood of murdered godly men, from righteous Abel to Zechariah, that you slew by you, slain by you in the temple between the altar and the sanctuary. Yes, all the accumulated judgment of the century shall break upon your heads, upon the heads of this very generation. So, it says again, verse 34, I send you prophets and wise men and inspired writers, but you will kill some by crucifixion, rip open the backs of others with whips in your synagogues, and hound them from city to city, and you will be guilty of all the blood of murdered godly men. Okay, <clears throat> and I'm not going to go there, but I mentioned in, I think, one of my first John teachings, if you want to go to my first series of teachings, of the Old and New Testament, in teaching number 38 and 39, I already shared that, you can, uh, in those two teachings, I talk about um, God restoring 
his true church. And I talked about the uh, Reformation, the days of the Reformation. And I talk about in those teachings, the days of the uh, Catholic Inquisitions uh, for 1,200 years that lasted, where the popes and his armies and the armies of the kings that aligned with the popes, uh, how many godly Christians that were murdered and put in prison and tortured because of the very thing I'm teaching, because they left Catholicism, the established church. And they began listening to the ref ref reformers like Martin Luther and others who came along and said that Martin Luther himself believed that we were all called to be priests. And he believed in the being born again. And he taught that um, the Pope was not the divine head. And he was hounded. All, all these men in these early days were hounded and imprisoned and tortured. And the Pope and his would send armies and wipe out whole cities sometimes that left uh, the Catholic Church. And you can go to these two teachings and learn all about that. And it's in history books. It's it's known history. It's not, it, it's, it is a secret to most people, but it's true history fact. But just, I just bring this up to share how it says here, they tortured and killed and hated all, all those that God sent them to tell them the truth about coming into, into the kingdom of God through being born again, through being filled with the Holy Spirit, so that you can follow Jesus personally for yourself. And I'm not saying that you don't have to attend any church at all. We are supposed to gather together as believers and share the Word of God, pray together, uh, pray for one another to be healed. Uh, this is important. Jesus said not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together, especially as the end draws near. But we are not under the authority of one divine head that as far as a man, physical man, that tells us what we can or cannot believe to have eternal life. We are, on, we are under the head of the Holy Spirit, who Jesus has sent to lead and guide us into all truth. He is the invisible head. There is no visible, supreme, infallible head of Jesus' church. The Holy Spirit is the invisible, infallible head only. And he gives us ministry to bring us up so that we can learn what our ministries and our own priesthood is. So, that is Matthew 23. Again, he says in verse 13 and 14, Woe unto you Pharisees and religious leaders, you hypocrites, for you won't let others enter the kingdom of heaven, and you won't go in yourselves. Okay, so, Jesus said to enter the kingdom of heaven, to see the kingdom of heaven, first of all, we have to be born again, and I covered what that meant in the last teaching. To enter the kingdom, to enter what you see now, what you have a new heart to want to do and pursue, you need the power to do that, and you have to be receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, or be born again of water and of the Holy Spirit, to enter into what God has planned for you, so that you begin to see and understand and perceive the calling of God on your life individually and become his priests and his ministers. So we finished chapter 3 of John. And so it's uh, only a half hour teaching, a little over maybe. But that's all I'm going to cover now because I just wanted to finish up uh, the Gospel of John chapter 3 for this teaching. And so go ahead and read ahead in John chapter 4 for the next teaching. And this is, this is the story of Jesus meeting the woman at the well. And so we'll go, we'll pick up there next time. Thanks for joining me.